you think about the Chicago outfit, what do you think about? You think about Al Capone. Um, you think about maybe Tony Accordo. Even here a little bit about more recently, uh, Operation Family Secrets. Our next guest had to make the gut-wrenching decision to change his life. We're here with Frank Calabrese Jr. on the next Armchair NBA. Hello, Tom Levecki here with the latest edition of the Armchair NBA. I'm here to welcome Frank Calabrese Jr., former associate of the outfit in Chicago. Frank Calabrese Jr., welcome to the Armchair NBA. How are you doing today? Good, Tom. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's my pleasure. So we're going to jump right in. Um, you know, I, I um, admittedly, I always knew of you. Um, and I obviously researched when we connected and said, hey, let me learn a lot more about him. And I think there's a lot to unpack. So we're going to jump right in. Give us a little bit about, you know, the patch where you grew up and what it was like growing up, Frank Calabrese Jr. Okay, well, first of all, uh, my family is like, like, like most other families. Um, my, uh, my heritage is my mother is Irish and my dad is Italian. Okay. Uh, our family business happened to be organized crime. Okay. Uh, my dad and my uncle were both made members. My dad was high ranking in the Chicago mob, or we call it the Chicago outfit. A couple yeah. things different in Chicago than New York was there was one family instead of five. And also in Chicago, you weren't supposed to bring your family into this life, your sons. You were supposed to make a better life for them. Over the years with Tony Accardo and Paul Rica, they tried to go underground more. So a lot of stuff was underground. So growing up, I really didn't know what my dad did or in my neighborhood. So I grew up at Grand and Harlem, Elmwood Park. My dad was from Grand and Ogden, the patch. My mother was from Washington Boulevard on the west side, west side Irish. So in my neighborhood, our fathers were underground. We didn't have an idea of what they did. We knew they were a little different. Didn't pay much attention to it. Um, you know, as I got towards the end of grammar school there's some stuff in the papers and then 72 the godfather came out 74 part two so we started putting two two and two together but it was never presented to us so we didn't think much of it and it wasn't out in the open like in new york so you know we, we were we were taught to go to school and work now um describe a little bit because i want to set this up what was your relationship with your father growing up my father growing up my father was a good guy my father had a huge heart, you know, um, he was tough, but he was all about family. Yeah. He had a lot of friends. We always had big gatherings. My dad never spoiled us and never was flashy. We never wanted for anything, but we were never spoiled. He taught us manners. He taught us to work. I had my first job in, in fifth, sixth grade delivering newspapers. I had the biggest route on, on, on in the neighborhood. Yeah. So, you know, and there were a lot of rules, you know, we ate dinner every night at five o'clock. We were a close family. Yeah. Very close family. Uh, this life, my dad never intended to bring me into it, nor did he want to bring me into it. But in high school, he wanted to start teaching me about the street. A few things happened in grammar school that he's seen. He's seen yeah. some of him in me. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, there was an incident where there was a, a guy that walked up to him and they were arguing by the side of the house. And this guy was way bigger than my dad. You know, I was concerned because as a kid, you, you think the biggest guy always wins. And uh, I ran and grabbed the baseball back. I was coming up from the side and he caught that. So I think that's one of many things he caught. So I'm gonna, in high school, I'm going to teach you about the street. You're going to learn street smart. And you go to school and you learn book smarts. Yeah. You know, both in life, you'll be successful. And that's what I did. Now, one of the things, though, is um, there are variations between the outfit and and the new york cause in austria don't get me wrong new york cause in austria was indoctrinated and in the fabric of society but i always felt the chicago outfit might have even been more so meaning like during secrets and different trials and different stuff there were guys that were outed as made men that like were regular guys that you didn't know they were made guys and it was almost like you know versus new york you kind of know who's who would you agree with that statement if so can you elaborate yeah, definitely. So look, uh, some of the type guys that that, that started this, uh, uh, Paul Rica, Johnny Torrio, El Capone, they all originated in New York. 
So yeah. it was all my thought or my mindset was that they were taking the mistakes they made in New York and they were trying to perfect them. Hence, one family to five, going right. underground. You've got a new enemy now, the FBI, blend yeah. in with your surroundings. Their goal was to make the neighborhood a safe place and yeah. especially in Chicago, make a better life for your families. So, yes, definitely. It was very important to go underground. It was very important to blend in with your surroundings. surroundings. Many a times, they were curbing violence all the time. You, you couldn't go out and do what you used to do at one time. It had to be cleared through the bosses because, you know, they they had the FBI on them now, plus the public. The public, you know, through prohibition, there was a lot of violence. So the public was was looking down on them. Yeah. And they, they had that more business mindset but never yeah. leaving that 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 gangster mindset. A little bit of both, and yeah. uh, and uh, a little bit. Yeah, I saw one of your interviews, and it made sense. And and, and maybe later it changed, but up until like the two up until the two thousands, your era to the two thousands, um, when you had the Columbus War in New York, two Columbus Wars, the Castellano hit, and that kind of stuff. Um, there was kind of Pax outfit, meaning like peace in the outfit. Um, for a while, they kind of adopted that less or no violence, and that was part of the reason for their strength. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, they were going more legit. You know, you're, you know, the government's getting stronger. They got a lot of weapons. You're always looking for for ways to make money and more legit ways to make money. And yeah. violence, especially blowing things up, was really bad. For some reason, you blow some up, the government's all over you. Yeah. Um, so there was there was a time in the late '80s and the '90s where they were where there wasn't a lot of violence and, 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 and everybody was making money. What was your first racket? Um, as a kid, I started out in peep shows with my uncle going to collect the money every week. Interesting. So that's what I learned. I also learned um, loan sharking. Loan sharking was big in Chicago. My dad at one point had one of the biggest crews, if not the biggest. We never had less than a million dollars on the street at any given time. Charging on average about 10% a week, 520% a year. Yeah, and, you know, um, there, there were a lot of ways to make money. Um, there were there were uh, places that paid protection. Yeah. Street tax, excuse me. <coughs> and um, so, and, and there was legitimate stuff too. You, you yeah. Making legitimate money. So, so you were, you know, you were not a street guy per se, but you're obviously getting groomed by a, you know, made guy, your uncle's a made guy. And now you're 17, 18 years old. Did you, you know, attend college? Did you go to the street? You obviously had like kind of a fork in the road. What did you do at that time? So the more I did for my dad, the more he's seen of him and me. And he, and he started bringing me into this more and more. And because he couldn't bring me in life, he would always say, you're my secret weapon. Yeah. So basically, mostly worked with my dad and my uncle, met a few other people that were that were in the crew, but it wasn't out on the street because I always worked a full-time job. I had a job with the city. Yeah. And so I had side businesses. I did rehabbing, roofing, whatever I could do to make money. I was always hustling. And, um, you know, so slowly my dad brought me into this more. I wanted to go away to college. I yeah. wanted to be a lawyer. When we got out of high school, my dad had this control problem with all of us. He wouldn't let us go away to college. And my two brothers were both A students in high school. I just got by because I didn't care. Hmm. So he said, instead of going to college, I'm going to get you that city job. And at night, I worked with him. At some point, I bought into this. Did you um, – okay, so so I um, – myself, my family, my, my close family, our family's from Italy, and um, we were not – a connected family, but we had members of our family marry into some pretty substantial people. And being from Italy, we had a little more access to like young guys from the other side and that kind of stuff. Um, however, my experience always has been the mob families kind of hung out with the mob families and the non-mob families stayed away from them by hook or crook, you know, you know, and uh -huh. um, and that would just been my experience. Growing up, did you kind of your family vacation and hang out and barbecue? kind of with other members of the outfit or was it more about the community and it really didn't matter? It was, it was both. It okay. was both. Um, but the one thing was you never conducted business when you were um, around regular people. Um, you know, uh, my dad didn't over the years as the government was getting stronger, he didn't want to hang around with the crew. What we would do is we'd do business together, but we yeah. didn't do it out on the corner where everybody can see it. We met right. at meeting under the cover of darkness, constantly moving, okay? 
and um, setting up the meeting the next week. But once a month, he would have a dinner at a restaurant or something in a back room or something where all the guys would come in. And that was our socializing. So pretty much all the guys I hung around with were all my friends that were all they weren't in the light. And then there were guys I worked with that were, but I didn't hang around with them. Tell us about your uncle. Um, um, there is, a, a, to, at least for me in my research, a fair amount about your father, respectfully. Um, but your fa- your uncle, not so much. Tell us a little bit about Nick Calabrese. Sure. So my uncle graduated high school. My dad didn't graduate. Gram- he just graduated grammar school. But my uncle graduated Steinman's in Chicago on the west side, same school that Tony Spilatro, a lot of guys went to. Yeah. Um, my uncle, um, he joined the Navy uh, right after high school. He actually volunteered during the Vietnam War. He was a radio operator with top secret clearance on the Bainbridge and Enterprise. So he's always volunteering for the most dangerous mission. He gets home. My dad gets him a job working on the Hancock building um, when they were building it as an iron worker. And uh, he really didn't like that job. And there was a guy he knew. There was only one guy that died. It was a guy he knew that fell, tripped over some lunch boxes, and died. Fell a few stories. My dad, my uncle didn't want to do that job no more. In 1970, my uncle told my dad that he wanted to join him in the life you know so that's that's where my uncle came in and again my dad kept my uncle very low key a lot of people didn't know most people on the street did not know how deeply involved my dad and my uncle were over the years my dad and my uncle were part of a crew that the bosses had picked when they wanted somebody killed and wanted it done in a timely manner There was another crew in the 80s and early 90s, too, called the Wild Bunch. They were another crew that was very good at killing, too. So you had the Chinatown crew, which my dad was part of, and the Wild Bunch was more out in the Cicero Berwyn area. Those were the two go-to crews. A lot of people didn't know that on the street. This all came out in the trial. Most people thought we just gave out money and some booking. That was it. And that's the way my dad wanted. So my uncle was very low-key. Most guys thought he was just kind of like my dad's lackey. But he was much more than that. And every, we were fine with everybody thinking that. You know, we drove Fords and Chevys. We didn't drive fancy cars. Yeah. You know, we didn't. You, you weren't supposed to be a Spacom. Yes, okay. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So one of the um, one of the things about the Al Capone era, right? And, and uh, those we have a lot of what I call mobologists watch us where they're really into like the history of it. And believe it or not, LCM was already in you know, Chicago, Unione Siciliana, which was the Sicilian Union, and Al Capone pretty much turned it on his head, took it over, and then made the outfit, the mob, right? As a result, in history, and we'll talk about modern day, your era, um, my understanding, though, it was a large outfit, thousand, like a thousand members and then associates and so forth. But my understanding was, could you be a ta- non-Italian and be a made guy in the outfit? or was it o- Or was it always strict back then? And how was it during your era? So during my era, I was told that you had to be 100% Italian and you had to kill on behalf of the organization before you can ask them. And very seldom did they ever open up the books in Chicago. They weren't making guys like they were in New York. In fact, there was a story that there was a a guy in New York making people and charging them $100,000 for a button. You know, so it became a business for some people. Chicago, very seldom. And you could be a very important person. That's why I think they called it the outfit too. You didn't have to be Italian to be part of the organization. I mean, look up Gus Alex, if you go yeah. back. Here's a guy that was very important, up working with the top guys all the time. Okay, could never be made because he was Greek. Um, there was a lot of other guys like that too. So you had to be 100% Italian. During our trial, it came out that one of the guys, one of the bosses, Jimmy Marcello, was half Irish. I do believe that somehow was hidden. Somehow. And whoever, you know, when they got made, and I believe he got made the same time my dad and my uncle did, you know, somehow that escaped. Now, I've talked to guys from New York, uh, Sammy the Bull. I've talked to a lot of other guys, and they said it it changed. At first, you had to be 100% Italian, and then it went to the father had to be 100% Italian. Got it. Now, what about... Yeah. And, and what, what about, so, so, okay, that makes sense. Okay. The other thing about the outfit, um, there was one family, right? And yeah. your uncle was literally the second since the beginning, that only the second made member informant for, from, from, to when they started 
to when your uncle flipped. This only the second made guy versus New York. It was countless, you know, tens or hundreds, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Why do you think the outfit maybe had less uh, informants versus New York? Um, well, first of all, I always thought Malcolm was the first. Who was the other guy? I have to forgive me. I researched that he was the second, but it didn't okay. tell me who the first was. Okay, I, I got to look into that. I, I, that's good to know. But yeah, very seldom you see that. And again, you know, it, me growing up around this and being by my father's side all the time, I heard a lot that was going on, and I yeah. knew a lot that was going to my dad and my uncle, and they were, you know. When they did things, it was like the military. It was yeah. a need to know. There were other guys. They didn't bring everybody in the room and say, hey, this guy's made, that guy's made. I want you guys to all get to know one another. Correct. So you didn't know a lot of things that happened. Even when they killed the Spilatros, they didn't want the body to be found. They they rounded up all the other guys at the house to leave, and somebody <laughs> stayed behind, and Michael didn't know who, to bury the bodies so that you didn't know. Um and I think they were just very, very picky on who they brought in. It, 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 you didn't get in overnight. Yeah. Really had to earn it. And the numbers were smaller, but they were powerful. And part of that power is it was divided. A lot of guys were either street guys who did heavy yeah. work, violence, or they were money makers. And they had both. And the people that were running it, you know, used the people for what they were best for. At one time, these crews, like I said, when they killed, it was a crew that went, just like the military, Special Forces team. Later on in the years, it got sloppy because they were putting guys together that never worked together. So that was one of the, the, you know. So, yeah, it was very, very orchestrated and and regimented the way they ran things from what I'd seen when I was around it. (laughs) So, So it looks like by having that one family structure, you had operational efficiency, right? And people were in the right role at the right time. Any business or any mafia family that comes into play. Now, what about um, what advantages to having a one family? I know Carlin gave me you know, at one point try to well, rustle everybody up and make it one. They still had territories, so yeah. technically you you belong to a certain territory, and you could do business anywhere. But you had to check with the people you were doing business with. If it was in a certain territory, you got to make sure either you got to split it with the people that in their territory or they, that person was already spoken for. You could say no. Now, the one there still was there's still were arguments. There was still you got to realize, even though it's an organization, there's still, yeah. there's still a bunch of criminals. You know, they're very headstrong and they're always trying to, to, to get one over on the other one. And that's when you had sit downs. You know, yeah. it's sit-downs when two guys were arguing, you sat down. You know, my, my dad was one of the best at the sit-downs. He always used to tell me, know your opponent, know what their takeaway is. Let them go first because it's human nature to want to plead your case. He goes, then I would poke holes in the case. He says, and the guy would start changing his story. Well, who are they going to believe, the guy changing his story or me? So he said, I'd win a lot. And he goes, and sometimes I went in there and lied through the whole thing and still win. So there were still problems, but it seemed to run pretty good. Now, uh, one of the things I, I felt that you said was interesting is, um, which is kind of the modern mob, you, although your father had many bodies under his belt, and we'll talk about that in a minute, your father was pretty diplomatic. When somebody owed him money, like he treated like a businessman until he didn't need to. Tell us a little bit about that, Frank. Yeah, well, my, my, father's, my father was a good businessman. His only downfall at times or setback was he always wanted everything for below wholesale and sell it for above retail, and he convinced. That's, uh, that's the Italian way. <laughs> yeah, he's a master manipulator like that. But but he did run it like a business. First of all, if you wanted to borrow money from us, we had to know you, or somebody else had to know you. Otherwise, we wouldn't talk to you. We need to know how how many kids you have. Are you married? We want to see some of your paychecks because we didn't want to bury you. Because if we bury you and you can't pay us, who's going to call the FBI? Your wife. Because you're going to say, oh, I owe these guys money. They're going to kill me. Now, if you have a problem and you come to us, say you borrowed $5,000 from me at 10% a week, you got to pay um, you know, a nice chunk every week, and you can't do it. It's just something happens. You come and you say, you know what? I can't pay all this money every week. I would say, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. This is what my father would do. So I'm going to make your balance 10000 Can you pay me $100 a week? It'll come off that 10000 until you're done. Don't miss no. As long as you're paying, my father was fine with that. Now, if you were a gambler or you were out screwing around and we heard about it, then you'd get a warning, maybe a crack in the side of the head and a finger in your face or, you know, 
a window broken or something, they'll let you know, hey, don't mess with us. Don't make a fool of us. Only in extreme matters when you knew you couldn't get the money and somebody was really making a fool of you was there major violence. And I didn't see that too many times. Now, you you know, I understand you had your own book, you had your own businesses, things that you did. Being on kind of on the street, if you will, were you more Frank Calabrese Jr., the associate, and had your own respect because you built your own name? Or were you always kind of Frank Calabrese's son? Um, A little bit of both. Okay. So on the street, I could handle myself. I won the Golden Gloves in 1980 as a heavyweight. I could handle myself. But I don't like violence. Yeah. So I was considered a nice guy on the street who can handle themselves. And I was fair with people. People knew who my father was. So if I came to you and talked to you, it was either coming from me talking to you or my dad talking. I'm talking for my dad, two different things, you know. And basically when I went for him, he would tell me what to say and what to do, you know. Um, so there was there was a kind of a respect in both ways. But I was more liked than feared. Now, you're obviously an intelligent guy, you know, business, you know, the mob life. Um, the mob is a career. I mean, I'm not saying it's the right career or a good career, but it's a career. So why you were in that life, like what was your end game? What was your exit strategy? You want to be a made guy. We're going to make money and get out. We're happy being an associate. Kind of well, you know, walk us through that progression. Sure. So while I'm working with my dad, you know, they're always testing you, always seeing if you're ready for the next level. When my dad didn't let me go away to college, it really broke my heart. So I'm working for the city in the day. I'm working with my dad and my uncle. And at some point, I, I bought into this, but I didn't really buy into the mob. I bought into my dad, my uncle. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. So I can never be a made member. I'm half Irish, you know. And as a kid, I was very shy. So, you know, it wasn't like I was out there, you know. Yeah. Um, I'd cry when I'd fight. I'd be kicking the shit out of a guy, but I have tears in my eyes because I would want to be his friend. Why did we have to fight? Why did you do this to me? But it's at some point I bought into this. And it was in my early 20s when my dad came home from his night at work. His adrenaline's going. He goes, we got to talk. We went in the bathroom and he says, remember, I told you there's no drugs in Chicago. Remember, I told you there's there's rules. And if you don't follow the rules, there's consequences because we had to kill two guys tonight. And he's looking right in my face. He wants to see my reaction. He's explaining the detail. how he blew him apart with shotguns. He wants to see if I'm ready for this. Well, I thought. Wow, you know, it's crazy, but this is my dad. He's got my best intention in hand. And if people break rules, you know, this is the way life is, as crazy as it is. So I bought into it, you know, and 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 then I graduated and and I and I got into that life. I just figured it was gonna be my legacy. You know, so naturally when you're out on the street, not only am I working and doing legitimate stuff, now I'm out there looking for my next score. How am I going to make money? You know, it, it really is an addiction on the street. You're taught yeah. all this stuff by some of the best and you're out there looking for it and you see things that average people don't see. And it, there's a high to it. Um, you said it a little, little bit earlier that um, your story also remind me a little bit of John Gotti Jr. story that I believe John Gotti Jr. in his interview said, my father was a truck driver. I'd be a truck driver, whatever that was. So that kind of resonated a little bit your story and John Jr.'s story. So as you were in this life and as you were getting closer to your father, um, you know, what did you see and when did it start to go sideways? Well, I've seen this life change in my dad. So in this life, I learned early on, you've got to have two personalities. You know, you got your street and your home with your family. You know, on your street personality, you can't show weakness. Weakness can, could cause harm to you. Yeah. And so... I've seen my dad, these parties, these big gatherings, all this stuff, it, it started changing. And we started noticing over there as family members, my dad developed three personalities. He had that good guy home personality. He also had that gangster dad street smarts, but he started to become a sociopathic killer. And I didn't learn until years later. I mean, I knew he was killing people, but you know, over the years, it was like more and more and more. And these personalities started blending together. And I'm noticing this life is not what my dad said it was going to be about. He's not being who he was going to be. Not only me, my uncle, other family members. And I didn't like it. And all my friends I'm working with are all making legitimate money. I'm out there hustling, making good money. The government's getting stronger. My dad's getting more paranoid, more violent, more manipulative and controlling with all us family members. And we really didn't know who the man was no more. Interesting. When I had my kids in 90 and 91, I had had enough. 
you know, I had enough of him controlling me and everything, and I wanted to make a break. Unfortunately, my dad does not take no for an answer very well. And he didn't like the fact that I wanted to break away from him. He thought it was my wife that was the wedge between us. It was really him. I'd rather work. I got these kids. I don't want to put them through this. I'd rather work three jobs. Well, well, that's that, what I started. Well, that's what I wanted to ask because, um, you know, you have a parallel life, right? Frank Calabrese Jr. and then that, right? So you got married, you know, have kids. Was your wife kind of know what's going on? Did you have an exit strategy with her? You know how it works. Hey, hey honey, I'm just, you know, five more years or, Hey, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna keep book, but we're gonna open up a pizzeria. Like with wife uh, discussions with your family and your wife, what was that like? Well, my wife, my wife thought that I just ran errands for my dad. She just heard what she heard on the street, but she also heard from girls. You know, his dad controls him. You, are you, are you want to get in a relationship, and you know what the dad does, you know, and she says, well, I've been with him. He seems really nice, you know, and so she figured how bad could it be, and those are her famous words about when she realized years later that, you know, she was cooking dinner for all these murderers and sitting at her table, and yeah, it was rough on her. So she went through this whole thing where I was trying to get away from my dad, and she experienced it all, and she knew I was trying to get away. Um, and it's like I said, it wasn't easy. And, and I talk about that in the book a lot. I mean, there was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of different ways to try to get away. There were days when I just didn't know what to do. I have these two beautiful kids. I got a wife. I got this dad. There's a case lingering over our head for almost seven years that we may get indicted every day. And it was just, it was a nightmare for a while. And I didn't, um, I didn't handle it very well, but I handled it enough to survive. Yeah. Now, um, at that point, things started going sideways, and you took the liberty of uh, procuring some resources from your father. I'll let you elaborate, but you kind of... <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you, yeah. my grandfather used to say, money is your dad's God. You mess with his money, you're messing with his God. And it never sunk in. Anyways, my dad was a control freak. Over the years, he'd hold money of ours to talk about it in the book where we'd give him checks. It gave to a point where we wanted to start getting our money from him because we were older now. We had families. Yeah. He'd always hold it. He'd say it's better than keeping it in a bank. So I wanted to get, I wanted to take off with my family and get out of here. A lot of events happened that I just didn't trust my dad anymore. And um, when you start over, you need money. I knew where he had money hidden around the city. Not only did he have it in banks and everything, but he also had it hidden. It was a spot I went to that he never went to. And there was an awful bag with close to 800000 in it. He owed me close to three. I was going to take my three out and leave. But I said, you know what? I'm going to take all of it. I'm going to fuel all these businesses. I'm going to make a bunch of money on the street, put it back, and take off with my family and go out to Arizona, California, or something. Yeah, a few years went by, and uh, I got more stupid. Everything was going good. I actually became a little bit of a spot cone, which I was always taught not to. And um, and I decided he hasn't come around. He knows it by now. It's gone. I'm going to keep it. I earned it. Instead of putting it back and taking my family and leaving, I kept it all and moved back to my neighborhood in a nice house. Dumbest move I ever made. And when my fa dad found out, he went berserk, berserk. He actually, he actually tried to kill me, and I talk about it in the book. And I don't know how I got out of it that night, but um, I got out of it. And then things just kept going downhill from that. And then we got indicted in that, um, in the case, in the op, in, not in the family oh. secrets case. It was a, it was a case prior where um, we got indicted with me, my uncle, my brother, my dad, and four other members. Um, okay, so I don't want to give too much away. We're going to put a link to Frank's book below. Um, but your father held a gun to your face, and you were certain that you were going to die. And I loved how you got out of it. If you could talk a little bit about the, what happened, the emotions, and what so, you did. So I'm going along, and my dad finds out, so I start getting him this money back. And when he found out, he told me, now I own you. I own your businesses, your wife, your kids. I own you report to me three times a day. I thought my life was over. I didn't know what to do. I started getting the money back as quick as I could. And I got him the majority of that money back. 
pretty quick. And I'm only I'm always hoping maybe I finish paying my dad off. Yeah. I stick around and he wants something from the restaurants, you know, because I was giving him a check to yeah. money out of there. And, you know, maybe he'll leave me alone. You know, that, that unconditional love. You know, you're always looking for that. You know, I'm almost paid off. And so one day he calls me and it's good dad. He says, hey, son, let's meet by the park. Let's go for coffee. You know, I miss you. It's about time. I was happy. I went and met him. We hugged it out. We kissed. We're in the truck on our way to get to get coffee. He goes, hey, you got keys to the garage. I got to run in there for a second. Yeah, I got him with me. All right, why don't you take a walk? I want you to finish that funny story you're telling me. I walk in there. When I walk in the garage, I hear the door slam. I turn around. Bam, he's got me by the neck. He's got a gun in my face, and he's got that glassy eyed look when he kills. He goes, I tried controlling you. You're uncontrollable. Oh, no, he set me up. I thought I was too smart to be set up because I knew the game and played it. He goes, I'd rather have you dead than you disrespect me. He goes, you know what? I don't like you. You got no fear. That's dangerous. Oh, no, he's going to kill me. My kids are going to go through life not knowing him. I got to get out of here. I'm crying. I'm trying to hug him to stay close. I won't break eye contact. And I'm saying, Dan, I'm your son. I've been paying you. I've been doing it. I don't understand. I don't know what I said or did, but I got out of that garage that night. And um, my dad always said, don't ever pull a gun on somebody and not use it. It'll come back to haunt you. From that point on, and I went back and got that gun and carried it every day from that point on. Um, I didn't trust my dad anymore. Wow. So then at this point, mentally you're checked out. <clears throat> yeah. And I got these little kids. I got this case lingering over my head. The government's getting stronger. The mob's getting violent with each other. What's going to happen next? And when I got indicted, I said, you know what? That was a blessing in disguise. This is going to be my way out. Against, I was going to be getting away from my dad and, and changing my life. So I looked at it. I actually volunteered to do my dad's time so he didn't have to go to jail. Wow. So then I like the story of when you decided it aligned to going to the other side. When you were in jail, you actually put on gloves to type the letter to the FBI. So obviously it was well thought out. Um, you know, give us a little bit of the context of the letter and, and what happened next. Sure. So I get to jail and I find out I'm going to the same prison as my dad. We wind up in the same prison, which was awful for me because I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to screw everything up. I can't believe it. I'm trying to get away from him. I'm in jail with him. So yeah. for, I was already down six months because I was one of the first guys in. I get to Milan, Michigan. I'm down eight months with my dad, but I'm going to work on my relation with him. Now, I always feared my dad, you know, and he was the only man in life I ever feared. I respect what other men are capable of, but I feared my dad. I lost that fear, that six months in prison. So I said, I'm going to work out my relationship with him. We had made promises before we went in. I had to develop a powder cocaine habit, which I promised him I'd never do drugs again. The last day I ever did them was right before I went into prison in 97, never did them again. He promised me that he would never pull me back into this life and we would work on our relationship because he oh, tried wow. to. So that's what we were working on in prison for eight months. And he seen me doing such good time that he was so proud. But he found out I was divorced. And he started manipulating me because he thought my wife was the wedge between us to bring me back in. Back in. It got so bad in prison between me and him that I said I had enough. He's lying. He's manipulating. What am I going to do? I came down to two choices. Wait till I get on the street, confront him. Well, he's better at what, I, what he does. I'll probably wind up there or get a hold of the FBI. I didn't know the FBI, and I don't know if I trusted him, and I was doing good time. So what I did was something the FBI told me they never had done before. I offered them a business proposition. I went to the prison library. I wore winter gloves for no fingerprints, typed it for no handwriting. It didn't put anything personal there. Basically, that's what I said. My lawyer, nobody can know for my safety. Don't bring recording equipment, pen, pen and paper. And... Um, I'll do all my time, pay all my fines, no immunity. I just want to help you against my dad. And I sent that letter out. And I, you know, in the letter also said, I feel like I have to help to keep this sick man locked up forever. And so when they came, the first thing they wanted to do is put me in front of a grand jury because they thought I was doing bad time or I had a fight. The prosecutor came out there, sat with me for 20 minutes and said, don't ever put that kid in front of a grand jury. This is 20 years in the making. He's finally had enough. 
They wanted me to wear a wire. I said, no, he caught guys twice in the street. No. But then after thinking about it, I said, I'll wear one because my dad's too smart to manipulate his way out. How did it feel when you wore the wire for the first time and we were talking to your father? Um, so what I did before I wore the wires, I went in there. This you never make a decision overnight. Like I said, this this is I knew my life was gonna change. It was hard because I'm like my father's tormentor and his savior at the same time. I told my dad, well, I went out there and I says, because how am I gonna get this man to talk? So I went out there and I says, Dad, you know what? I want back in, but I got some issues with you. And if I don't get these issues straightened out with you, I'm done with you for it, Dad, too. He was so excited I wanted back in that he said I was going to take over the crew with Ronnie Jarrett, who was running on the street and gave me the name of the first guy he wanted me to kill as soon as I get out. So right there I knew the whole time. He goes, what's your issue with me? So what I did was I pit my uncle against him, which made him very mad. So these meetings with my dad was because he thought I was coming back in, and he wanted me to know who to respect, who's doing what. And in the meantime, we're working on a relationship and he's talking about all this stories. You know, like, is that guy tough? What did he do? And, you know, we're out on the prison yard and I knew my dad better than anybody. Okay, so it was hard. It was a war on me. In my gut, I knew I was doing the right thing, but I was looking for that proof the whole time too. Am I missing something? And I never got it in prison. I didn't get it until I got it out of prison. Okay, so, so who flipped first, your uncle or you? Me. Okay, so then why did your uncle flip? They tried to kill him in prison. My dad sent his blessing to another prison because when I pit my uncle against my dad, my dad got so mad at my uncle. He was mad at him before he went into prison. He thought my uncle was trying to be our father and knock him out of the spot. It was this phobia my dad had. Anyways, he sent his blessings to another prison where my uncle was staying with two guys in the life that they've killed people with and said that there's some problems on the street. I'm not sure. I'm sad to say my brother might not stand up, so I give you my blessing to do whatever needs to be done. Oh, shit. So they tried to kill him, and that's when he started cooperating. Okay, so fast forward, family secrets. Um, did you cooperate just against your father or with other people as well? I cooperated against my father. I wore a wire on a couple of other guys, but I also made a deal with the government before I wore that wire that they would be unindicted co-conspirators. And the government kept their promise on that, and they were unindicted co-conspirators. So we, we um, a lot of stuff's been unfolding, whether it be Sammy and his other you know, the folks that got deals, that the government wasn't always maybe keep the promise, or they did some kind of um, out-of-pocket stuff. Was the feds always above board with you, or did it? The people I worked with in the feds at the time, the two prosecutors and the agents kept every promise. Now, also, because I volunteered once a month, my probation officer had to go in front of the judge with two FBI agents because he wanted to make sure that they weren't trying to force me in to do something more because I, didn't, I had no obligations to them. And they never did. No, they kept, I told them, if you guys bother my family, or close legitimate friends, I'm done. Just lock me up and I'm not going to testify. You know, and they never did. They kept, it was, I tell you, it was, a, it was, a, it was a surprisingly good business relationship. They're not my friends. I weren't their friends, but yeah. we worked well together and they allowed me to lead in prison on, on making a lot of, they just would suggest stuff, but they knew that I knew what I was doing and that I knew my dad better than anybody. So you testify, your father goes away. Um, he obviously dies in prison. Um, how, how many years was he in prison post you flipping? And did you speak to him before he died? Okay. Um, so he was in, he went in in 97 in October. I went in, I'm sorry. Yeah, 97 October. I went in in 90, uh, 97 in July. He died 2012 in prison in a terrorist lockdown because he had put on a hit on my, me and my uncle when we were cooperating. And he threatened a prosecutor during the case. So when he went back in, he had to go on a special lockdown. It's called Sam's. All terrorists are in there. And he died on Christmas Day, 2012. I did get all my dad's journals and um, crates and crates of, you know, 302s on the case. 302s are interviews the government does. Court testimonies, history, his journals. He had journals, hundreds of pages writing about a lot of stuff. I am working on a project with all of that also. But I can tell you, my dad locked down four years was tough as hell.
He dies his favorite day of the year, Christmas Day, 2012. But you didn't speak to him at all during that time, correct? No, I was not allowed to. And here's the thing, too. I knew my dad wasn't going to change. Yeah. And there was no reason for me to speak. And we went way past that point. You know, I, I know that he was telling a lot of people, it's not my brother, it's not my brother, it's my son. He set this all up. My brother was tough, but he... He, he wouldn't be able to set this up. They was trying to get somebody to kill me because I, I, I refused witness protection. And um, and nobody would listen to him. And, and your, your uncle went into WITSEC, correct? He did. Yeah, he had to go because he had to do prison time. He actually got the longest prison time out of all the guys that cooperated. He got the most time. Interesting. Do you speak to him at all? I do speak to my uncle. I have spoken to my uncle. Uh, we see some differences on some things, um, you know, but uh, we've, we're we learning as a family, you know, even with me and my brothers and my mother and everybody, we, we might th see things differently, but we're, we're, we, we, we get along, you know, we still remember we're family. Yeah. Uh, and everybody has their own little issues with everything that happened to each one of them. Got it. It really tore this family apart. It really did. Now I want to, I don't want to give too much more away because of the, you know, get the book. Um, I know you went to Arizona, but then you're now back in Chicago, right? I'm in Chicago for the summer. So what I'm doing is I'm doing tours. I'm doing private events. I did a big one last night. It turned out very well um, in Chicago, but uh, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in Las Vegas. I'm going to be working with the mob museum too. Yes. I'm doing tours out there, private events, my webpage, family secrets, tours.com gives all that information and um and i do have my book on there too so if you want to buy it through my site i send it usps uh priority and there's a box there if you want me to sign it and write something i will beautiful we'll put that link below to wrap up oh, well two more questions before we wrap up one is how's the outfit fair nowadays in your opinion well my opinion is well first of all I, I don't sit here and bash the outfit. I mean, there were guys that lived it the way it was supposed to be lived. Yeah. Make a better life for your kids, the community, all that. They were fair with people. Unfortunately, my dad and his boss, Angela Lepitra, they became sociopathic killers. And yeah. they were very violent. So for me, it was a little different towards the outfit. Um, I don't believe anybody that was part of it at one time that's still alive is doing anything illegal. Now, the government's got too many weapons. These guys made money over the years. Their kids are grown now and they have successful businesses. So they're either helping finance their business, helping them out. It, it's everything we used to do is legal now, too. So there's some people around, but, but I would say a couple little groups here and there that are probably doing minor stuff. Um, otherwise, people are legit. You know, it, it's, you know, I, um, I'm doing my tours. I mind my own business. I'm not naming people that are out on the street or trying to get them in trouble. Yeah. I don't go in certain areas where I don't belong out of respect to other people. Plus, I don't want some 18-year-old to come up and shoot me in the back of the head because yeah. he just watched Goodfellas and thinks he's going to make a name for himself. Good point. Final question, uh, Frank. Could have dinner with any mobster, dead or alive. Who is it and why? I would have liked to sit down with Paul Rica. That's a good one. Business-wise, I would love to see his mind and his mindset. I always say Chicago had so many, I guess I could use the word, important gangsters and important racketeers that it kind of gets overshadowed by New York. Rick, I mean, I, I always say Accordo was probably the most, relatively speaking. The That's most why I was, because it was between him and Paul, but they worked together side by side from my understanding. Yeah, there was a lot of great guys in New York, a lot of smart guys. Uh, I picked because I'm more familiar. Um, and I always wanted to pick a business-minded person because that's more me. You know, I know violence. I know you. I know their mindset was, look, you can always hire tough guys. Correct, correct. And, um, but, you know, if you don't have that mindset, where are you going? You're just more of a, like a street gang. I, I always uh, uh, thought of him as like the Frank Costello of, uh, of the outfit. Yeah, yeah. All right, going to put a link below to Frank's site. Frank, I know this was last minute. I appreciate you being on. We'll thank probably have you back soon. We'll keep in touch. And Frank, thank you so much for being on the Armchair NBA.